Hello, good afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, ICTS Infosys uh, Chandrasekhar uh, lecture series. Uh, and uh, it is uh, the, IC uh, the Chandrasekhar lecture series, as I mentioned in the morning, is in the uh, is one of our special lecture series in the physical sciences, uh, and has. Uh, uh, by now had a number of uh, very uh, distinguished uh, people uh, giving, uh, giving the, uh, the talks. So it's a particular pleasure to have actually Ashwin Vishwanath uh, uh, give the set of lectures. This time uh, I've known Ashwin uh, from, I guess, Kanpur. We've all labbed in Kanpur and then uh, Princeton, Boston. Uh, and of course, Ashwin is a local Bangalore person, so uh, from many points of view, it's uh, terrific to have him. Uh, but uh, I think I'll leave the, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think I'll leave the, uh, the more pleasurable task of embarrassing the speaker to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Smitha. Uh, and uh, so uh, over to you, Smitha. It's really a privilege to be uh, introducing my contemporary and friend, uh, Professor Condensed Matter Theorist, Professor Ashwin Vishwanath, in this um, Chandrasekhar lecture series. And actually, uh, Chandrasekhar has been a life, for me, a lifelong hero. Uh, not only did I know about sort of his work on stellar dynamics and uh, astrophysics from my very early days, um, through my late black hole physicist father, he was also a family friend. So when I was a teenager, I had the good fortune of um, interacting with Chandra. Now at the same time, unbeknownst to me, there was another marvelous physicist in the making, and it was uh, his formative years in St. Joseph College, and then he actually moved on to IIT Kanpur, um, and in both places, along with Rahul Dravid and other people, he, <laughs> he was, and, and Rajesh as well, he was recognized as a sort of very distinguished alumnus. I met, Ash of course, I'm talking about Ashwin. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I first met um, Ashwin in uh, Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, when uh, he, was, he, he was doing his uh, PhD work with 2016 Nobel laureate um, Duncan Haldane at the time. And then um, he'd come over to the West Coast for about a year. And that's when I really had the pleasure of uh, meeting Ashwin. And I'll stop at any more embarrassment, except to say that even from then, he was quite a role model in terms of how one could be both an interactive and an introspective um, insightful physicist. So all of us grad students, if we had any questions, we'd always go to Ashwin and he would tell us how things were. Um, so then after that, he received his, uh, he, he went on as an MIT Papalardo Fellow from um, 2011 to 2000, sorry. Let, let people think I'm really young, that's okay. <laughs> 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 From 2018 to 2019. No, I'm just kind of kidding. <laughs> so, no, 2001 to 2004. And then he joined um, Harvard as faculty, and he stayed there till 2016. Uh, Berkeley. After Berkeley. Sorry, I'm so sorry. He went to Berkeley as faculty uh, in 2004. And then in 2016, he moved to Harvard as faculty, where he is now. So, faculty at Berkeley, followed by faculty in um, um, in Harvard. So, um, as many of you know, Ashwin has worked on a range of highly uh, diverse and highly cited uh, uh, set of topics, along with other very illustrious um, collaborators, both in theory and experiment, uh, superconductivity and magnetism in many fascinating guises and forms. He's worked on deep confined criti uh, quantum criticality, which he's really well known for topological states of matter, time crystals, graphene, uh, quantum entanglement, and even theory of computation. Um, I, I won't list, obviously he's received a lot of recognition for that. I won't list them all, APS Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellow, Euro Europhysics Award, I won't list all of them. 
But I will just say that I still really very much admire the kind of um, physics that Ashwin does. And as most of you know, um, a lot of the topics that I mentioned, they're also being studied uh, right now in, or being talked about right now in this discussion meeting that we have going on in tandem, um, in novel phases of quantum matter, where we also have a really spectacular um, set of speakers giving lectures, and I think many of whom are right now in the audience. So without much further ado, Today you can get a taste of the excitement that we're all experiencing right now from Ashwin's lecture on um, topology and ent entanglement in quantum matter. So without any further ado, yes, there's one small further ado. <laughs> uh, so uh, there is a small little ritual that we have before the, uh, the lecture begins. And I'd like to invite Professor Bhaskaran from Math Science uh, uh, to come and hand over memento on behalf of uh, ICTS to the speaker. <laughs> so, so there's a small uh, sandalwood Buddha here. Mm, very nice. Mm -hmm. Good. That's sort of the bag is for me. <laughs> so, no, no, <laughs> nice. Now it's over to Ashwin, finally. Okay, so uh, you know, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to give this uh, lecture, um, and it's very uh, it's a big honor given all the previous speakers, given the name of this lecture series. Um, so I've known, um, I've seen ICTS really um, since the beginning, I think, when Spenta and Avinash and others were uh, had this um, small place in ISC in a different campus, um, and uh, you know, right from then it was very clear that. Uh, it was destined for you know great heights, uh, and I think uh, the new campus, having Rajesh as uh, the new director, uh, all the programs that we heard about in the morning, uh, I think it's really uh, fulfilled its uh, promise, uh, and uh, I'm you know I'm really happy I can uh, you know spend quite a bit of time at the center, given that I'm also uh, a local uh, person. I grew up here in Bangalore, and uh, my family is uh, is here, so I get to spend some time. Uh, every year, uh, and I think this is maybe the second discussion meeting I'm, uh, I'm, ha uh, I'm at. Uh, so thanks everyone for all the organizers for putting it together, and you know all the great talks and the, uh, um, the participants. Um, really looking forward. Um, so uh, I'll try to talk about a few things if, uh, that I've been interested in, and I think which roughly summarizes the topics that people have been talking about. Uh, in this uh, discussion meeting. Um, uh, and uh, of course, the, the ingredients are really uh, uh, topology and quantum entanglement, um, yeah, but really in the context of um, quantum many body systems. Okay, so it'll be important for us that we have many particles. Uh, we're really thinking about the entanglement and many quantum particles. Uh, and the quantum mechanics will also be very uh, central, although you'll see that there are, you know, it's inspired work in more classical realms, and um, uh, this is not to say that uh, you know the many interesting uh, classical uh, uh, you know phenomena we heard about today, for example, are is just not part of my my talk. Um, so, if you like, one of the things I'd like to think about, uh, at least in the first part of my talk, uh, is how do you classify uh, different states of matter? And um, I'll try to uh, you know uh, give a few more details what this. Um, what this program means, at least to me. Uh, and we'll see that the two very important tools we are going to use in this uh, project are uh, the ideas of topology uh, and the ideas of uh, quantum entanglement. Okay? So rather than describing some uh, you know, collection of problems that uh, involve uh, topology and quantum entanglement, I'll try to focus it on the search for the classifying framework for different uh, states, uh, states of matter. Okay? And then I'll give you some applications very briefly, I'll talk uh, about these uh, you know, uh, topological phases of free fermions, relatively simple uh, to describe, but they have a lot of uh, very deep physics. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about interacting states, like the fractional quantum Hall effect, and uh, just to mention briefly uh, this remarkable new physical platform. We're still trying to understand uh, this magic angle uh, bilayer graphene. Okay, my next lecture will talk more 
try to focus more uh, about it. Okay, so, um, so just to start with, pick one of these topics, let's talk about quantum entanglement. And I know there are people with different backgrounds, so let's start very uh, simple. Um, so let's talk about quantum entanglement at uh, this, uh, this level. Apparently, there's a book like this. Okay, you can buy it on Amazon. I, I didn't actually do that, but uh, <laughs> uh, yes, we all know what su quantum superposition is, right? You have a bit. Everyone likes to think in terms of uh, quantum bits these days. So uh, a bit is, of course, 0, 1, but the quantum bit can be in any superposition state. Uh, this is something that we're relatively used to, but quantum entanglement is a slightly more uh, subtle uh, you know, kind of phenomenon. Uh, so you need at least uh, two uh, bits for this, uh, for an example of this. Uh, and uh, the first such uh, state was, uh, you know, proposed by EPR, um, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. Uh, they were thinking in terms of photons, uh, a pair of photons and their polarization states. Um, so let's consider a state, a quantum state that looks like this. Again, it's a superposition. Um, and just like this superposition, we're going to make sure that each of these photons uh, is, uh, has a 50-50 probability of being found in, you know, the state zero or the state one. Okay? Uh, but there's an essential difference. Uh, here I have a pair of these photons and they put them together. If one is in the state zero, so is the other. One is in state one, so is the other. Uh, so really the special thing over here is that although if I measure any one of them, completely random, whether you get zero or one, uh, once I know the measurement outcome for this one, it immediately fixes uh, the measurement outcome of the, of the other uh, photon. Okay, so that's really this quantum entanglement. Um, and, uh, you know, this, of course, uh, got these people very, uh, very worried. Um, uh, and the, uh, the argument they made, uh, actually it was quite a, a precise uh, kind of argument, is that if you think of quantum mechanics as being a complete theory, it should predict anything um, that is known with certainty. Okay, so if something is certain, quantum mechanics should be able to predict it. Uh, here we seem to have a certain... Uh, outcome, if I measure B, A is certain to be in that particular state. There's no way they could have communicated with one another. They are spatially separated and so on. Uh, so somehow quantum mechanics is incomplete. That was sort of their reasoning. Okay, but of course, this made certain assumptions. Uh, this is making certain assumptions about reality, uh, which, uh, you know, turns out is just, just simply does not hold uh, in our world. You know, you can try to uh, come up with ways of, uh, you know, thinking about this uh, this phenomenon that, uh, you know, you have this thing that is uh, random, but it's perfectly correlated. You could try to build a classical uh, model of this. Okay, so uh, one classical model of that is, um, you know, what's known as hidden variables. Um, is, it's a simple illustration is that you have these pairs of socks in your drawer. You pick one at random, uh, and somebody else picks the other one, the same color, uh, at the same time. Okay, so you have this situation where you're perfectly correlated, uh, you don't know which of these pair of socks you picked. You don't know the color, uh, but you know for sure the other, other person has exactly the same color. Okay, so could you cook up some situation like this, some probabilities um, that you associate with this process uh, and end up getting all of the physics of quantum mechanics? Okay, so in other words, is there a way to make some hidden variables uh, theory work? Um, so it turned out this is actually, um, um, you know, a, a very... A precise uh, problem that you can actually put, uh, you know, uh, convert into an experiment, uh, and that's exactly what uh, Bell, uh, uh, John Bell did, uh, and it was finally uh, experimentally studied by Elaine Aspect and various other people. Um, so what you can show is that any theory like this, uh, if you subject it to the right kind of measurements, uh, which I won't describe right now, um, you end up getting uh, a certain prediction that the outcome from certain uh, experiments, you make this quantity, the outcome should be, uh, you know, should live within this unshaded uh, region. Okay, whereas quantum mechanics tells you that the outcome of this experiment uh, will lie along this curve. You know, sometimes this curve is within the classically allowed region, but sometimes it kind of dips outside into the classically forbidden region. Okay, so if you can do an experiment, uh, you can tune this parameter. It turns out to be the angle of some polarizers to measure the photon. Uh, and if you find points that live in this classically forbidden region, you can rule out with certain caveats this kind of a classical uh, hidden variables theory. And that's exactly what uh, this experiment by Aspe and his group did. Uh, they measured the, exp uh, you know, these photon polarizations falls exactly on the curve predicted by quantum mechanics and in fact goes into this region that is classically forbidden. 
Yeah, so this quantum entanglement is a real thing. It's not just some you know, complicated um, uh, correlation of, of classical variables. Uh, and it's, you know, it's fairly well understood at the level of you know, two photons, three photons, and so on. Um, and what we'll be really interested in is uh, what happens when you have many quantum particles. Okay, so the kind of quantum spin system is a very simple example. At every point in space, you have a lattice, uh, which has a spin up or spin down, this qubit. Uh, and what are the kinds of quantum entanglement that you can have uh, between these different uh, quantum bits? Okay, and it's very easy to, uh, you know, to see that even for a relatively small number of bits, uh, the number of uh, possibilities that you have, the number of configurations, is enormous. It, it explodes very quickly. And on top of that, you have a macroscopic uh, material. You have 10 to the 20 uh, atoms in a, in, a, in a grain of sand, let's say. Uh, so we're really talking about uh, numbers that are even, you know, as astronomical doesn't really do justice to this. Right? This is uh, really uh, crazy kind of numbers. Uh, and this somehow quantifies, uh, you know, the different states your system can be in. And uh, we want to make progress with this, uh, with this problem, as, uh, you know, this gigantic Hilbert space. Um, and how do we say things that are universal that really uh, refer to the physics of, of such systems? You know, it turns out that you're not really looking at the most general quantum mechanical wave function. Typically, what you're trying to do is you have some macroscopic system. Uh, you have a ground state, which, which the system enters when you're at very low temperatures. You cool the system down. You really emphasize the quantum mechanics. Uh, and you're trying to characterize the ground state. And it turns out you don't typically explore this uh, enormous space, uh, but you do have some... Uh, freedom, and we really want to characterize this freedom. And we want to characterize it at the level of certain qualitative features, uh, which is really the, uh, the, the concept of a quantum phase or a, or a phase of matter. Okay, so, so we're used to, um, you know, the physics, the quantum mechanics of one particle or two particles, uh, but this is really demanding us to look at many, many um, uh, interacting particles. And we know that even in the classical realm, uh, there's many, many new phenomena that occur that you don't get with uh, one or two particles. You get new phenomena with, uh, with, a, with many particle systems. Uh, the most obvious uh, example is just, uh, you know, uh, thermodynamic quantities, temperature, pressure. You know, they, they're a property of a macroscopic number of atoms or molecules in a gas. Uh, there's a notion of temperature and pressure, which isn't there in the level of one or two atoms. Okay, there's some simplifying uh, physical features that appear. Uh, and we'd, the main thing that we'd like to do is to understand uh, what are such emergent properties, such emergent laws that, uh, that appear in the, uh, you know, in, uh, when you think about quantum, system, quantum many body systems. Okay, so, um, so one of the things, another thing that appears, uh, at least in the classical realm, just like uh, temperature and pressure, when you have many particles, is you get phases. Okay, you get phases of matter, you get phase diagrams that look like this. A simple uh, phase diagram of a classical substance would be water as a function of temperature and pressure. You get different phases, and they're all separated by phase transitions. Okay, that's maybe a way you can define a phase of matter, a pair of phases of matter. You have to go from one to the other by crossing this phase transition where something singular happens, you know, boiling of water or freezing, it's some, uh, something clearly singular is happening. Uh, if you always find you have, to, you have to cross such a phase transition, you have two different phases. Yeah, and uh, we'd like to understand what, what are the different kinds of uh, phases that you could have. Uh, but very soon you run into some complexity, uh, you run into a subtlety, which is actually known for this uh, phase diagram of water. Uh, you know, liquid gas, uh, you know, liquid um, water and water vapor are extremely different at ambient pressure. Enormous difference in their density is a factor of 1,000. Uh, but of course, if you go to higher temperatures and higher pressure, difference in density begins to go down. Yeah, and eventually, if you go to high enough temperature and pressure, that distinction goes away. Uh, the liquid and the gas begin to look identical. Uh, and so you can go from the gas to the liquid phase simply by circumventing this phase transition. Okay, so viewed in this bigger parameter space, what you thought of as being different phases are actually the same phase. You can go from one to the other without ever encountering a singularity or a, or a phase transition. Okay, so that's really one of the issues with trying to classify phases of matters. Somehow you really want to think about uh, you know, the qualitative properties, so not quantitative things like the difference in density, which could change, but really qualitative properties, and you'd like to identify all the different uh, qualitative properties. Okay, so for example, you may start, after you know this, you may begin to wonder, maybe there's a way to go from the liquid into the solid, a way to uh, 
circumvent the freezing transition. Is that possible? Uh, you may worry about that. And it turns out that you can actually um, prove that there's got to be this kind of a phase transition, uh, but that requires some more concepts. And you'd, you'd, like, you'd like to identify something that is clearly qualitatively different between a solid and a liquid. Okay, so to give an example, maybe this is not really required in this particular audience, but for non-physicists, I think it's, it's kind of useful. Uh, so what you're trying to do is uh, you know, analogous to this game. Okay, there's this game that you know, back in the day when people would actually play games with you know, some physical uh, <laughs> thing, uh, you, you have to take this arrangement of uh, numbers and move them around We're using the empty square. Go from this configuration to this one where you just flip the last two numbers. And the question is, is it possible? Uh, so if it's possible, let's say they are in the same phase. You can go smoothly from one to the other. Uh, if the only way you can go from here to here is to break that puzzle apart and then, you know, reassemble those pieces together, that, you know, that's like your phase transition, right? You did something singular and you went from one to the other. The question is, can you go from here to there? And uh, apparently when this, this puzzle was introduced, like in the 1800s, uh, there was a big prize, uh, you know, offered to somebody who could actually do this. And, uh, you know, it must have been that the makers of this puzzle knew it was impossible. Right? Uh, of course, nobody won that, won that prize. And there's a way to show that you cannot go from here to there by what you can do is you can define um, a quantity. It's zero or one, a parity if you like. Um, and you can show that the moves that you're allowed preserve that parity. And then you can calculate that parity for these two configurations, and you can show the parity is actually different. Okay, so um, uh, so we, this is a way to show that these are different phases, if you like. Okay, so we'd like to identify something like that for many body systems. Okay, some analog of this parity, and we'd actually like to identify every single version of this quantity, so that if I am able to calculate this list, I find two uh, states that have the same values for everything in this list. I can certify that they're in the same phase, that maybe you can't quite see it because you don't have enough knobs. You can go smoothly from one to another without ever encountering a phase transition. Now, on the other hand, if you find two numbers that differ on this list, you have to encounter some phase transition, uh, and that would complete the program of classifying states of matter, whether it's classical or quantum. Uh, if you extend this to zero temperature quantum ground states, that's really trying to classify quantum states of matter. Yeah, so people thought that they had figured this out. They thought they had figured out all the distinctions between, um, between uh, states of matter, uh, but it turns out that it's not quite true. It's, it's incomplete, and actually even now we don't really know this complete list. That's the program, trying to find this complete list, uh, and um, you know, even or at least finding new members of this list, that's a little less ambitious. Uh, eventually we hope to be able to prove completeness. Yeah, so what did people think was the real distinction between states? Um, so they really thought it had to do with symmetry. Okay, so if you have um, you know, a certain symmetry to begin with, the state, your ground state, or low temperature phase can actually break that symmetry. Uh, and different ways of breaking symmetry correspond to different uh, states of matter. Okay, so there's a, a quantity like this parity, the classical order parameter, uh, that distinguishes the different symmetry breaking states, a crystal, Ferromagnet, the spins are all pointing along some particular direction. They've broken the rotation symmetry of space. Crystal has broken translation and various orientation symmetries of space. Superfluid looks, sounds like a very exotic phase, but um, you know, there's some symmetry that's connected to the conservation of helium atoms, let's say. And that symmetry is spontaneously broken in superfluid. Okay, so pretty much all the states that people had, some exceptions, but pretty much all the states that people knew about, they could fit it into this paradigm this uh, order parameter uh, paradigm. It's extremely useful, actually. It turns out, uh, you know, some of these symmetry-breaking patterns are quite subtle, like breaking translation symmetry of space. Uh, that led to the space groups, 230 different types of space groups for crystals. If people could classify that, and in fact, every single one of these space groups is realized by some mineral in nature. Okay, so, into X-ray scattering, you can figure out which of these 230 they live in. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff there for people to uh, keep busy, um, but there are kind of two problems. One of it is comes from experiments. It turns out it's not right. There are states that defy this paradigm. There's another thing which uh, you know uh, you may be a bit dissatisfied about. It turns out that all of these states are not that quantum mechanical. Okay, so if you like, um, if you think about entanglement, you know, we are talking about this enormous number of quantum particles have all the all these kinds of entanglements patterns, 
But if you think about ordered phases, uh, there's at least some caricature of the phase, something that captures the essential physics of the phase uh, that's simply a product state. And a product state in the sense that you don't have this interesting kind of quantum entanglement. For example, spins on a ferromagnet, a very crude picture is every spin is sitting up. And um, it's a very classical kind of state. Even something like a superfluid sounds like a very exotic state. Uh, but you can write on a caricature of the wave function for a superfluid. Uh, for example, in this atomic, uh, in this uh, atomic gas uh, optical lattice system, particles can be they can be zero or one particles on a site, uh, and the superfluid wave function looks something like this. Uh, it's a superposition of zero and one, uh, but then it's simply product on the different sites. There's no interesting quantum entanglement, at least at some caricature level. Um, so it would be somewhat disappointing with all these opportunities for quantum entanglement. If all the states that you actually realized only occupied the sim simple corner where you can sort of squeeze out all the quantum entanglement and still essentially describe the phase, it would be a bit disappointing. Okay, so fortunately, that's not true. Um, so, and experimentally, people found states that uh, you know, violate the simple picture and really have non-trivial forms of quantum entanglement. Okay, so these two things go together, going beyond this order parameter paradigm and getting interesting forms of quantum entanglement. Okay, so what is the experimental discovery in the 1980s, which I'm sure all of you have heard about? Um, so there's this experiment done on a very clean uh, two-dimensional semiconductor, uh, measure a Hall effect, so uh, apply a voltage in one direction, measure the current in the perpendicular direction. Uh, you can define a resistivity, uh, and what is found is that instead of being some random uh, number, this, this resistivity is quantized, it takes on certain values that are uh, proportional to an, uh, inversely proportional to an integer. And these you can think of as different phases. Okay, to go from one integer to another, there's no way to do that smoothly. There's a phase transition, um, and there's a sharp transition. And these different states all have the same symmetry, but they're distinct at the level of something else. Okay, there's some other distinction. Uh, we'll see that it's actually a topological distinction. And in fact, this uh, overall value of the Hall, Hall resistance um, is accurate to one part in a billion and entirely related to um, uh, fundamental constants of, of nature, H and uh, E, right? the Planck's constant, the charge of the electron. Okay, so we'll see that this is actually found application. Uh, now the kilogram is defined in terms of this uh, Hall resistance. Okay, so, um, and of course, the amazing thing is all of this is happening in a device that looks like this. Okay, you get quantization one part in a billion. Uh, of course, this is a clean sample, but you know it's cl as clean as they can make it. It actually looks like some complete mess with all kinds of leads coming in. There's a little bit of this sample there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in a setup like this, it can organize itself in an in a extremely robust way and give you integers, basically, right? and give you some of the best measurements uh, of these uh, fundamental constant ratios, uh, despite being a, a, a rather uh, messy kind of experimental setup. Okay, so clearly there's some robustness over here, and the robustness is really in, uh, inherited from, uh, from topology. Okay, so, uh, so as you know, this, uh, the subject of topology originated with people trying to classify manifolds and, and shapes. Uh, so you can make any kind of smooth transformation. Same topology, you punch more holes. The sphere, the torus, and so on, different number of holes have different uh, topology. Okay, and uh, there's this uh, famous formula due to Gauss. Um, where he said, of course, you can just look at this and say what the topology is, how many handles. But if you're an ant that's crawling on the surface, uh, you can also tell what the topology of the surface is. You have to keep measuring this quantity called the Gaussian curvature integrated over the surface. This Gaussian curvature is some number. Uh, you keep measuring it, go and integrate it over the surface. And you find remarkably it assembles itself into this uh, product, uh, 4 pi times 1 minus the number of handles. Of course, 4 pi times an integer. Uh, so, of course, Gauss had many theorems, right? He was an extremely uh, prolific uh, mathematician, but apparently he called this his, uh, his remarkable theorem. Okay, so he was really proud of this. Uh, and it came out of his interest in, as a surveyor. You know, he was um, uh, charged with uh, doing all kinds of uh, topographic surveys of, um, uh, around where he lived. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting combination of applied and, and pure physics and pure uh, science that uh, you know maybe we don't see that much of today, uh, but it's kind of good to remind ourselves that these connections between uh, what is applied and what is uh, pure um, 
uh, you know, goes, sometimes goes both ways, right? It's not just you discover new things and then you find applications. Um, so we'll see that this kind of topology is very similar to the topology that uh, protects uh, this amazing quantization of the Hall conductance. Uh, and that was discovered by uh, these people, uh, at least in the, in the, uh, in the, in the form that we, uh, we would like to say it right now, uh, TKNN. Uh, so they showed that in a, in a certain kind of periodic solid, if you look at the motion of electrons moving through the solid, you get electronic bands. Uh, and then there is an integer that can be associated with each of these bands, the Chern number. And the formula for the Chern number looks a lot like uh, the Gauss formula. Uh, there's a certain curvature that you integrate over the Brillouin zone, which is really the Fourier transform of this periodic uh, solid. Uh, you do that integral. This could be some real number. You go around the Brillouin zone, integrate it, and you find that uh, it assembles itself into 2 pi times an integer, just like this number of handles. And these different integers label the different Hall plateaus that was uh, seen by, by von Klitzing. Okay, so you can say that this integer, very abstract topological quantity, can be measured simply by measuring the Hall conductance. There's another very physical way of thinking about it. It corresponds to edge states. Okay, so for the, when you're in the deep inside this two-dimensional system, uh, there's an energy gap. Uh, that's simply the gap between these two bands. But once you get to the edge, uh, this band gap fills in, it necessarily has to fill in, and you get states that propagate along the edge at low energies. Uh, these uh, edge states that move just in one direction, and the number of these edge states is really the number of these integers. And all of these statements turn out to be logically uh, the same and give you this uh, amazing uh, quantization of the Hall conductance. In the, but now we can go back to our main question, which is, uh, you know, now that we have a, a system that is really distinct, a states of matter that are really distinct on the basis of a principle that's different from symmetry, uh, can we also see if it is different in terms of quantum entanglement? If it has somehow utilized this, this wide uh, uh, different options that you have for um, quantum entanglement in, in a many body system. Okay, so of course to do that, to talk about that a little more uh, in detail, you have to have a way to quantify uh, entanglement. Um, and um, so this is uh, one way to do that. You have a wave function. This is the wave function of the state that you're trying to describe, that you're trying to understand. Uh, and you split it into two pieces, left and right. Uh, and you have wave functions that live only on the left or only on the right. Um, so this is analogous, if you like, to this two photon wave function we wrote down. There's a wave function for the photon on the left, one on the right. And then I add it. I have different pieces that I add together. Of course, if you add only two states, you know, this is pretty much uh, you know, one of the uh, states that you can write down. Uh, but if I have uh, a big system, uh, I can have different wave functions appearing over here, making this product, uh, and then being assembled with some square root of a probability, just like the 1 over square root 2 is over here. Uh, this collection is called a Schmidt decomposition. It takes a wave function and tries, attempts to break it into two. If you have a simple product state, things that don't talk to one another, uh, then there's just one term in this product. And this probability over here is just one. That's kind of the trivial state. Okay, when, you, when you end up utilizing many terms over here, um, uh, then you have more and more entanglement in some sense. And you can also look at the quality of the entanglement. You can explore it uh, by looking at these numbers pi over here. Okay, so you can, for example, create, if you have any probability distribution, you can write down an entropy. So this is the entanglement entropy for between the left and the right. Again, if p was just one, if there was just one term, in this uh, sum, ones and zeros, if you like, uh, the entanglement entropy is zero. Okay, so if you have a product state, entanglement entropy is zero. Uh, but it's a lot bigger if you have one of these states, for example. You can calculate the entanglement entropy. It's actually log two. Okay, so, um, so that's one way to do it, characterize it in terms of entanglement entropy. The other thing that you could do is to uh, think of these probabilities as Gibbs weights. Okay, they're not actually Gibbs weights, but they're some positive numbers. Uh, non-negative numbers, you can think of it as the exponential of some energy. And we can call, it, call these some pseudo-energies. Okay, so sometimes you're going to plot a spectrum with these pseudo-energies as a function of something else. It's called the entanglement spectrum. Okay, that's another way to, to specify uh, the quantum entanglement of some particular state. Okay, so there's a more conventional way of doing this. I'll very quickly go over this. It's not really important uh, for us, which is in terms of a reduced density matrix. Sorry, you can't see it over here. But essentially, you trace out one part of your system, trace out system part B, you get a density matrix for the region A, 
Um, and again, you can use that to define this um, entanglement uh, Hamiltonian. It's, it's uh, I, just to tell you that it's the same. Okay, so now let me get back to this uh, churn insulator, the quantum Hall state. What's the entanglement uh, property of, of that? So one of the key properties of this churn insulator, you know, you can think of insulators as being in two different ways. One is you fill this band, energy gap, that's what gives you the insulating state. Or you can simply think of it as the electron is just sitting at certain sites. Okay, so the electron is so strongly bound that you get an insulator. You know, it turns out that for a churn insulator, for many insulators you can do that, uh, but not for the churn insulator. Okay, for this churn insulator where you have this non-trivial Hall conductance, you can think of it as filling up a, a band, but you really cannot localize that electron to be sitting on certain sites. And this property shows up when you try to cut the system in two. Okay, so when you cut the system in two, there's no way for the electrons to sit just on one side and the other side. There's no product state that's allowed if you're in one of these churn bands. So if you do this entanglement cut, you plot the energy, these probabilities written as energies now as a function of momentum around the cylinder, uh, what happens is that you see something that looks like that. You see uh, um, a branch of uh, entanglement uh, levels uh, that cross zero energy. Yeah, and uh, this actually is reminiscent of the edge states. So if you were to make a physical cut, expose an edge, uh, we said that the band gap of the insulator gets filled in and you get a one-way propagating mode. That's what the one-way propagating mode looks like in energy and momentum. And actually, there's a close connection between these two. So you can either look at the excitations of the system when you make an edge, or you can simply look at the ground state wave function. It actually knows about the excitations in, in some way. Uh, you can do this entanglement cut, and you can actually expose something that looks a lot like this propagating edge. Okay, so that's really the entanglement signature of one of these uh, churn insulators. Um, and you know, if you wanted to, uh, honestly, if you wanted to understand the churn insulator, you probably didn't need this perspective. So you, you didn't have to actually think in terms of uh, entanglement. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to have a different perspective. It just gives you a different angle. And actually that's what happened when we, so we were you know, trying to think about all of these different uh, entanglement signatures of, of states like the churn insulator. Uh, and then we came across something from this line of reasoning that maybe was not obvious from some other ways of thinking about it. Uh, so we asked the question, what happens if you go away from the insulating state? Okay, so take some three-dimensional insulator uh, and assume it's a magnetic insulator, there's some technicality that I want bands that do not have any spin degeneracy. And uh, if I have this magnetic insulator, uh, I have some inversion symmetry, I need that to, to keep track of these bands. Uh, we asked the question, actually with Ari Turner, what happens when these bands simply overlap? Okay, this, is a, this is like a band inversion. You have bands with opposite uh, parity under inversion. Uh, what happens? And it turns out this entanglement argument, uh, this line of arguments I talked about before, when you apply to this problem, uh, it gives you a somewhat surprising result. It tells you that this has to be gapless. There is no way this overlapping band can be fully gapped. Um, it has to be gapless somewhere. And in fact, uh, you know, there are earlier uh, works that tell you that uh, typically when you have bands that cross, you have points where, in three dimensions, you have points where the bands do not open up a gap. Uh, instead, the dispersion near those points looks linear. It looks like this. Um, and it's essentially described by what's known as the Weyl equation. Okay, so if you had a relativistic system, it would be the same equation as written down by Hermann Weyl. And in the condensed matter context, it was discussed by Herring and Wolowick and other people. Um, but uh, you know, that's sort of a generic argument. But it turns out in this setting, uh, you have to have such, uh, such band touchings. Another thing this entanglement argument allows you to do is to make a direct connection to surface states. And of course, Hermann Weyl never thought about surface states of Weyl fermions. He wasn't thinking about the, the boundaries of the universe. Right? If you have a solid, because that's the first thing you think about in a topological state, and that's what we did, uh, we are wondering what were the surface states of this uh, system, and the entanglement argument tells you that there has to be some surface state. And we were trying to figure out what that was, um, and uh, we finally figured it out with, uh, uh, with Ari, and um, uh, you know, so, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so before that, let me just uh, remind you what the Weyl equation is. You all know what the for Dirac's equation is for the electron, four component equation. So Weyl essentially took a square root of that or a half of that. Um, <coughs> so he wrote down a, a, an equation that satisfies many of the properties of Dirac's equation, but with just two by two matrices. And the one deficit is that you're not allowed to write down a mass term over here because you exhaust all the poly matrices. Um, and 
you know, but Hermann Weyl was very happy with this equation. Uh, so there's a quotation attributed to him about this truth and beauty kind of debate. He said whenever he had the choice, um, you know, he would usually pick beauty over, over truth. Okay, so, um, uh, so maybe for that reason, uh, there was no physical realization of this Weyl equation. <laughs> Uh, so people thought the neutrino may be a wild, uh, wild fermion, uh, but then they found it has mass, and uh, so it cannot be a wild fermion, cannot be the simplest kind of wild fermion. Yeah, so then, of course, the obvious question is, can you realize this in solid state, right? In terms of electrons moving through a periodic potential, so we had some proposal in a, in a magnetic system called a parachloridate uh, with some certain kind of magnetic order, but it turns out this is quite a complicated material. It's still not very clear if it has this wild semi-metal phase. Uh, but since then, people have come up with much simpler materials, uh, tantalum arsenic, for example, where ab initio theory has predicted this wild, uh, wild fermions, and um, they've um, seen all the signatures predicted uh, in, in photo emission. Okay, but um, uh, so now that there are materials, you can ask what is the physics of this wild system. So one of the most interesting things is this surface state that I talked about. So we have this band touchings. Um, you go to the surface. Uh, and you find that there are these states that simply connect uh, the projection of these two band touchings. And they're called Fermi arc surface states because unlike a two-dimensional system which has a closed Fermi surface, this is really uh, half a Fermi surface. And of course, the other half of the Fermi surface uh, lives on the opposite, uh, opposite side of this, of this material. Okay, so taken together, if you take a slab, you have a legal Fermi surface. As you make the slab thicker, one half of that Fermi surface travels to the top uh, one half is at the bottom. It kind of pulls apart uh, what is the physical Fermi surface. Yeah, so, um, so of course, the, the hope is that this will have some physical consequences. People can see it in the photo emission uh, experiments as some weird Fermi arcs. Uh, but one of the questions we asked, is there a, a signature in a more uh, kind of direct measure of the Fermi surface? Uh, and one measure that is very well known is the so-called quantum oscillations. Yeah, so you may have heard this uh, thing, can you hear the shape of a a drum or something like that, a, a title. Uh, so this is like hearing the shape of a Fermi surface. And the way you do that is you apply a magnetic field, you get these cyclotron orbits that are very, their, their frequency is very characteristic of the cross-section uh, of these Fermi surfaces. Okay, so if you have a weird Fermi surface, like these Fermi arcs, you should have some really weird quantum oscillation signature. Okay, so we were wondering what that signature is, how, how do quantum oscillations work, uh, in the case of these half Fermi surfaces. Okay, so this is kind of the thought experiment we, we did with uh, Drew Porter and uh, Itmar Kimchi. Uh, let's say you have this half a Fermi surface on the top surface, apply a magnetic field, and you ask what happens to the electron. Okay, so, um, uh, so now if you apply, um, you know, if you think of the motion of this uh, electron, uh, there's a force, a V cross B force, just a Lorentz force, uh, which will uh, change the crystal momentum um, and it moves around the Fermi surface. You had a closed Fermi surface that simply, you know, executes some oscillation around the Fermi surface. Uh, but here you get to the other end, right? And uh, th that's it. That's the end of the Fermi surface. So what do you do? Um, so it's, um, yeah, so, it, you know, that, um, uh, but it turns out that when you apply a magnetic field, uh, the bulk of this wild semi-metal knows exactly what to do to accept that electron. Okay, so uh, it turns out that you get Landau levels in the bulk, um, and there's a chiral Landau level. There's a, a Landau level that moves up and a Landau level that moves down. And there's one conveniently located at this momentum that, move, that is moving down in this particular magnetic field. Okay, so when you get to that point, it turns out you transfer into the bulk. There's a Landau level state. There's a, uh, this is kind of the spectrum of Landau levels in the bulk. There's a right mover and a left mover, uh, or a uh, up mover and a bottom mover. And the bottom mover is right here at this momentum. We'll take it down. Uh, to the opposite side. Um, and then you've got the other half of the Fermi surface at that side uh, to, to go there. And then you can come back along the other, um, along the other chiral Landa level. Okay, so it turns out everything has to be consistent. There's a bulk and a boundary that's consistent with one another that allows you to have these closed uh, orbits. Okay, but it's a very strange orbit. It has a surface component. There's a surface part of it. There's also this bulk part where it travels through the bulk the real space of the bulk to get to the other side. Okay, so it'll have some very strange signatures. It should be a hybrid, if you like, of surface and bulk Landau levels. 
Okay, so there seems to be some evidence for this in this particular material. I won't go into the details, uh, just some quantitative picture. Uh, so they see two frequencies, so they see two kinds of Fermi surfaces. One is a bulk Fermi surface and one is the surface one. And the surface one is the one that is, um, that uh, the amplitude dies as you make it thicker. Okay, so as the slab gets thicker, the probability of it getting coherently to the other side is suppressed and you see this exponential decay. Uh, but on the other hand, it only, the frequency over here for this particular uh, oscillation only depends on the vertical component of the magnetic field, which is like what you'd expect for a surface state. It has both surface and, and bulk uh, uh, properties. Also, if you change the shape into from a, from a rectangle to a, a triangle, you don't expect coherent quantum oscillations over here because these different parts uh, go through different depths of your sample um, and they will not add up currently. Okay, so in fact, they don't see oscillations of one particular kind for the triangle, but they do see it for the, for the rectangular sample. Okay, so anyway, more experiments need to be done, but at least there's some preliminary evidence uh, that this kind of unusual uh, state uh, uh, is present. Okay, so let me uh, kind of, uh, actually, let me keep track of the time. So I have 20 minutes uh, left. That, that's actually perfect. Um, so the kind of topology and um, uh, the kind of states I've talked about, essentially non-interacting electrons um, that nevertheless, because of the, the big variety of uh, crystal potentials you can apply on them, you can get very interesting states. Uh, and one of the uh, applications I just mentioned was uh, this quantum Hall standard. In fact, in graphene, you can get this quantized Hall effect almost at room temperature uh, with, without very high magnetic fields. Uh, and now it's been used to actually define <coughs> some of our uh, basic units, the kilogram, instead of talking about some piece of silicon or iridium or whatever it is that kept in Paris, uh, it's now defined in terms of this, uh, this quantum of resistance. Yeah, there's another very nice application that, um, unfortunately, I don't have time to describe in any detail. Uh, so people have taken this idea of uh, quantized response and quantized states and gone back to classical systems, you know, taken another closer look at classical systems. Uh, so, of course, this quantum Hall effect appear, uh, appears from applying a magnetic field to a charged particle. Uh, but there's a classical analog of this uh, physics, which is a magnetic field can be replaced by rotation. And um, the way rotation acts is the Coriolis force is very much like the, uh, the Lorentz force. Uh, so if you think about the rotating Earth, uh, it's like there is an effective magnetic field up and down in the northern and southern hemispheres, which is from this Coriolis force. Um, so there's a very nice work by Brad Marston and collaborators who uh, point out that this very well-known Kelvin wave uh, that runs along the equator um, uh, can be thought about in terms of the boundary of some topological phase, where the churn number is being reversed as the effective magnetic field uh, is being reversed from the northern to the southern hemisphere. And it turns out this is not just some random wave that's running along the equator. It's important for things like climate. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, things like this would be very interesting to explore, uh, try to understand uh, in, in greater uh, detail, um, you know, some of these classical phenomena that have uh, topological uh, origins. Yeah, and maybe the third application that I'll very briefly mention uh, before talking a little bit about interacting states uh, is this magic angle graphene. You already heard a bit about it from the other speakers. And I'll talk more about it tomorrow, but let me just give you a preview of, um, uh, of, of this system. So this is graphene, of course, single sheet of carbon, um, monolayer. You take two layers of this, um, and uh, then you twist uh, you know, one layer relative to another uh, at some angle. Okay? And uh, it turns out you can make these devices with fairly well-controlled uh, angle. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at this uh, figure, maybe it's a bit hard at this large twisting angle. You take two lattices and twist them relative to one another, you get a moiré pattern. Right? You get this big lattice. Uh, and the smaller the angle, uh, the larger the period, uh, the, the larger the spacing between this moiré periodic uh, pattern. Yeah, and uh, so one is really thinking about electrons feeling not just the crystal potential of these carbon atoms, uh, but actually feeling this moiré uh, crystal lattice, okay, and that will modify uh, the electronic uh, uh, structure of the electron, uh, the, the electronic wave function, uh, and you can use that as a knob uh, to control the physics uh, in this system. Okay, so, um, so there is this magic angle, 
uh, which, you, uh, which is predicted to be about one degree. Uh, and the way you can think about this magic angle is, like we just said, if you twist this, um, this pair of carbon sheets, you get this Mori lattice. Uh, the larger you make the angle, the smaller the, uh, the Mori pattern come, becomes. Uh, so you can compare two different times. One is the time for an electron to go from one sheet to another. There's a tunneling between the two layers set by some typical energy scale or some typical time scale. And then there's a time for an electron uh, propagating in the graphenes with the linear dispersion of graphene uh, to go from one moiré cell to the next moiré cell. And uh, you may imagine that there's something interesting happens when these two times are roughly the same. If you think about the motion of an electron, if you have a very large angle, uh, there's a very short period for this moiré. Uh, and the time it takes to go from one moiré side to another, one moiré um, pattern to another, it barely gets time to go to the other layer. So that's the limit, the large angle limit, where the two layer interaction is kind of not important. Right? Um, on the other hand, you can go to very small angles. And going from one uh, moiré site uh, to another, uh, you tunnel many times back and forth. And then the tunneling becomes important. And the place it first becomes important is when they are roughly the same. Right? The two times are roughly the same. And that turns out to be one degree. You put in all the physical parameters of graphene, the strength of the coupling between the layers, the speed of electrons and graphene turns out to be one degree. It's one sixtieth uh, of a radian. Yeah, and um, uh, so really it's in this big, uh, so everything, all the scales that are in this problem are this angle, in the inverse of this angle, 60 times the scale that you have for an electronic system or the uh, separation between the carbon atoms. Uh, so this is 12 nanometers, 60 times bigger than the uh, atomic separation between carbon and graphene. The energy scales are also proportionally smaller. And um, um, so you get, it turns out, this is not obvious, but it turns out when you have, when you look at the electronic structure of graphene, as we saw in uh, Devon John's talk, uh, you get a gap, and inside that gap you have this mini band. This tiny band is a small dispersion that's sitting right inside, and all the physics, all the excitement about this twisted bilayer graphene is about electrons occupying that mini band. And using electrostatic gates, uh, you can actually tune uh, the chemical potential within that band, uh, this yellow line over here, and you can and look at what happens to the physics. Okay, you can uh, you know, move that chemical potential up and down. Uh, that's what's being moved over here. Uh, and it turns out that you go, of course, from an insulator to an insulator, completely empty to completely full. But in between, you don't simply get a metal. You get a whole cascade of uh, you know, different uh, phases that appear. There are superconductors, SC, you see over here. Uh, it's what got people really excited. There are also insulators, these high resistance states that appear that can only be attributed to interactions. Okay? Because once you're inside the band, you'd get metallic conduction uh, if it was non-interacting electrons. And one of the key questions we are uh, facing right now is what is the nature of these insulators? How is, what is the superconductivity? Uh, what is the origin of superconductivity? What is the pairing symmetry? Look at the temperature scale over here. It's a, it's a little bit more than a Kelvin. Uh, but you've got to remember that you know everything is this system is handicapped by this theta. Right? So you get it to one over sixty handicap. If you want to really compare it with other materials, electronic materials, you've got to multiply these energy scales by sixty, and then it becomes a fairly respectable high temperature superconductor. Okay, this is really high TC kind of scale of um, superconducting transition temperatures. If you make a fair comparison, if you give it a fair, uh, you know, fair playing field, yeah, and. Um, uh, so the connection to everything I said before, the topological physics I said before, is that in recent progress, we believe that the right way to think about this band is not like this, not as we've drawn over here, but to rotate your basis. There's a different basis, it turns out, which is the basis of roughly the A and B sublattices of graphene. And it turns out on that basis, these bands actually have churn number. And you should really think of this as a problem where you have opposite churn number bands, plus one and minus one, Taken together, they actually refer to one of these band structures over here. Um, and you should really think about electrons filling up these bands uh, with spin, spin degeneracy. And when you think of it that way, this, um, at least the insulating states we can understand, uh, we believe, uh, and there's a very natural ground state that's proposed uh, coming out of this picture. Okay, so um, uh, although there was no explicit breaking of time reversal symmetry and so on, uh, the model you end up with has uh, bands with churn number which of course have the opposite churn number band coming along with them for to maintain uh, time reversal symmetry. Yeah, so, uh, so now to go talk very briefly about interacting uh, systems. 
Uh, so topology and entanglement and strongly interacting systems. Uh, we talked about the integer quantum Hall effect, but of course if you have cleaner samples, go to lower temperatures and so on, you get very similar phenomena where the <coughs> Hall conductance is now some simple fraction, one third and so on. Um, and the, the way we understand that now is in terms of these exotic excitations, anions, um, fractional statistics, fractional charge, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, you know, this is very interesting and exotic physics, but you see that they're all uh, odd integer uh, denominators, one third, one ninth, one seventh, fifth, and so on. Um, except for one, one case, um, in terms of this one fraction which is, has got an even denominator, five halves. Yeah, and that particular fraction is even more exotic. It's got a further generalization, it, it's believed, uh, of statistics called non-abelian uh, statistics. And there's a state that's been proposed that's passed many tests, so-called Fafian state, uh, which has this kind of non-abelian uh, statistics. Yeah, so the question is, for these kind of interacting states of matter, it, you can also be talking about um, uh, quantum spin systems. Um, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you think in terms, how, what kind of topology do they have? What kind of quantum entanglement do they have? And uh, so here's a very simple model that has this physics. It's a spin model. Um, it has spins, spin a half on the sides of a, a lattice. Um, and it has these interactions that are picked for convenience. It's called the toric code. Um, this, this pair is called the toric code. And this is uh, interactions that are added to make it generic. It's some spin model which has no particular symmetry. In fact, you can add any term you like to this as long as it's local and it's not big. And it's not going to change any of the physics. Extremely robust. Uh, and it turns out as you vary these parameters, you end up getting two phases in your system. Phase one, phase two. Uh, and a big challenge is how do you distinguish these two phases? What is, the, what is really the physics that's uh, different between the two? If you have some symmetry, we could say, oh yeah, one is symmetric, one is broken symmetry. But it turns out this is no symmetry. Yeah, so, uh, <coughs> uh, so it turns out there's a way to understand this better uh, by going to a particular point in this space, going down here. Um, where you can understand this uh, really in terms of a gauge theory. Okay, so you go deep uh, into this, uh, more, uh, deep to this point where those uh, Hx and Hz are, are absent. And then you can see that the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, can be written in terms of loops. Okay, so I won't go through the exact mapping, um, but essentially by trying to minimize these terms, uh, you can write down the configuration of any ground state in terms of these closed loops. Uh, and you can think of these closed loops as some electric field lines. Okay, so it looks like uh, electrostatics, uh, except that this field line is, is only defined modulo 2. Okay, so it's not an integer or a, or a real number, just defined modulo 2. So it's some icing version of electrostatics. And this closed loop is just saying that there's Gauss law. Okay, the divergence of these loops is just 0. Um, and in this model, essentially what happens is that this is the right variables to think about it. Okay, so there's some. Um, uh, you know, some picture of a gauge theory that emerges, a gauge structure that emerges. Uh, and a gauge theory we know can have two phases. It can be deconfined or confined, uh, and that will be separated by some phase transition. And in terms of that, it's exactly what happens over here. Uh, the two phases that we have are the confined and deconfined phases of a gauge theory. And in terms of this is somehow generic, this is really how uh, distinctions between phases uh, states can arise. Uh, in strongly interacting systems. You can have some emergent gauge structure, and that gauge structure can lead to some deconfinement. In fact, the quantum Hall states are some uh, version uh, of this kind of physics. Yeah, so you can ask, if you have this kind of uh, state, what is the signature in quantum entanglement? Uh, so let me just quickly mention that before, we, uh, you know, uh, before I conclude. Um, so again, it turns out that one has to look at um, uh, you know, the, the quantum entanglement between two regions, A and B. Uh, but for this discussion, it's actually good to think in terms of entanglement entropy. Okay, so we didn't talk that much about the entropy. Um, so the entropy, if you like, is, uh, you know, let's say you trace out this region B, uh, and then you have the further option of measuring your region A. Okay, the entropy tells you how much more information you get uh, when you measure this, uh, this region A. Yeah, and uh, so that's sort of an information theoretic way of thinking about uh, uh, entropy. Uh, and uh, for general systems, for general states, you expect that this entropy actually just goes as the boundary of this, uh, of the two regions, okay, the, the parameter of these two regions. It's called an area law. Um, and so this is very generic. Pretty much any state, any gap state will have this physics. 
uh, the thing that's new for these topological states is that there is a correction uh, to this law. Okay, there's roughly speaking a constant, a subdominant constant uh, that actually characterizes your topological phase. Okay, so if this constant is zero, that's like the confined phase, nothing interesting happening. If this constant is non-zero, for example, for the Z2 gauge theory, it's some fixed number, just log two, uh, that characterizes this constant. And um, so that's really the entanglement signature of these um, strongly interacting topologically ordered uh, states. Uh, and one way to understand this result, again from this information theoretic viewpoint, we said that this entanglement entropy is really how much information you get when you measure the system. Okay, so you have some, uh, some system described in terms of closed loops. You have the Gauss law. Um, so you have the different configuration of loops, which is really the information that you need to get by measuring your system. Okay, but actually, you know more than you think, in a way, because every loop is closed. There's always a, a Gauss law constraint on the loops. Um, so not every configuration is possible. There's a constraint on the set of configurations. You know a little bit more than you think. So there's actually less entropy than you might think. That's this constant sub subtraction of this constant. That constant is exactly log two. That's the information in the, in the Gauss law. I think something could be open or closed. The lines could be open or closed. Um, but we know it's always closed, and so you have one bit of information more, uh, and that's really this, this constant. So it has a very simple and robust uh, character to it, um, and um, uh, you know, it's a way to characterize in, from a, a, a quantum entanglement perspective uh, these topologically ordered phases. Okay, so I seem to have talked about two different kinds of topology. There's this topological order, strongly interacting electrons, quant fractional quantum hall, uh, there's also this non-interacting physics, non-interacting electrons, topological churn bands, and so on. Um, so is there any connection? So it turns out in recent years, we have found some remarkable connection between these two kinds of topologies. Uh, so the edge states of some of these free fermion non-interacting systems, uh, they can be gapped. They can be, you can acquire a gap if you put on top of them one of these strongly interacting topologically ordered phases. And, um, this connection has been sort of very fruitful. It's called surface topological order, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about it in this in the third lecture. Uh, but that's uh, led to like a, a amazing connection between subjects we thought of as being different before. A fractional quantum Hall effect and topological insulators, two different areas, uh, dualities, and so on. They've all kind of uh, the leap schultz matters theorem, which uh, I believe Masaki talked about last week. So many things that I myself worked about, worked on in the past, thinking of them as separate subjects. I thought I worked on them because I just liked them. They also had the same flavor, you know. Uh, but I think now we have some precise way to connect them all together uh, into some, some bigger, uh, bigger picture. So for example, we believe now that the surface of the three-dimensional topological insulator can be replaced instead of having a Dirac cone. I didn't talk much about this three-dimensional topological insulator, but instead of having a Dirac cone, you can actually have a gapped surface state that completely respects all the symmetries. And the state, uh, it turns out, is very closely related to this five-halves uh, Paffian state that people have talked about in the fractional quantum Hall effect. It's a twist. There's some twist on top of that. We call it the t Faffian or the pH Faffian state. Um, but essentially, the same kind of physics uh, that from you know, the weird uh, fractional quantum Hall state in the, in the sequence turns out to be related to the surface of the three-dimensional topological insulator. Okay, so there are many interesting connections that are just sort of uh, you know, beginning to, to understand um, and, and really make these uh, you know, have much more insight now, which I think will feed back into our uh, you know, program to try to find these kind of states and experiments. New experimental realizations of these states, I feel is, is very much dependent on deeper insight, really understanding how things are connected together. Uh, now, maybe one way to realize these non-abelian quantum Hall states is to look at the surface of topological insulator and strong interactions, something like that. So the hope is it will lead to actual physical experimental uh, results as well. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so I, I've tried to uh, describe how when you have many quantum particles, you get new phenomena, and you know, the, there's a lot of uh, very new and uh, interesting physics that appears. It's also hard. You know, you, uh, to actually know what a particular Hamiltonian does can be quite hard. So we have taken a more conceptual approach to try to really understand what the options are. And uh, it's linked to this quantum entanglement. So we've talked a lot about quantum entanglement to characterize states. But it's really what a quantum entanglement has another feature, 
people talk about quantum communication, quantum computing, it's really quantum entanglement that's behind it. All the non-trivial algorithms and communication protocols are really connected to quantum entanglement. Okay, so a deeper understanding over here may, may be important for quantum technologies uh, as well. What quantum technologies are useful for, that's much less clear, I think. But this way it'll be, I think, uh, it certainly help. Um, so let me conclude with a quotation, a very kind of upbeat uh, quotation. So all of you know, at least in India, everyone knows Le Corbusier. Right? He's the guy who built Chandigarh, uh, or at least planned it. Um, so he has this very, um, um, you know, uh, like upbeat idea, which is certainly wrong, right? <laughs> Today's reality is the utopia of yesterday. Can you imagine we are living in the utopia of yesterday? <laughs> And the utopia of today is nothing but the reality of tomorrow. So, of course, he's not talking about you know, human, human beings. He's not talking about politics, for sure, right? <laughs> so what is he talking about? So the guess is he was actually talking about exotic quantum phases. He's saying today's exotic quantum phases is, you know, today's reality is just the exotic quantum phase of yesterday. And tomorrow you're going to find all these exotic states that we talked about uh, <laughs> and we're only dreaming of uh, right now. So... Yeah, let me conclude with it. That is tomorrow's lecture, yes. <laughs> Questions? Sir, uh, in the calculation of quantum entangle, uh, entanglement entropy, um, we are dividing the system, right? I mean, are we not breaking any symmetries of the system by doing that? Very good, yeah, very good. You do break symmetries, that's right. Um, so, um, and and turns out that's that's kind of important for some of these uh, questions. Um, like, for example, if you wanted to capture something that was very related to translation symmetry, uh, you know, or you know some other symmetry that uh, does not accommodate such a division, uh, you may not be able to pull it out very easily. So, one of the things we did uh, actually that is one of the main points in this work with Turner. It was uh, also with earlier work of his with Ellis Berg and Masaki. Uh, it turns out some symmetries that you seem to break, for example, you cut a chain into A and B, looks like you break inversion symmetry. Because you do, do an inversion, you go from A to B. But it turns out you can implement the symmetry in, the, uh, uh, in this uh, entanglement analysis. Um, so you, you, have a, you go from A to B, but you have the Schmidt decomposition that allows you a way to come back from B back to A. But it turns out this, in this net result, what happens is this inversion symmetry becomes an anti-unitary operator. And that allows you to uh, characterize all of these inversion symmetric uh, states. So sometimes, although you seem to break it, you can restore the symmetry. Uh, but in general, it is, a, it is an issue. If you are very symmetry-dependent states, then sometimes entanglement is not the right way to go. Yeah. Uh, Ashwin, uh, very nice talk. Um, I don't know whether you will be covering this tomorrow, but uh, my question was how sensitive uh, the interaction effects are on the twist angle. Uh, the reason being, okay, the band flattening is one thing, but the Moiré lattice size also changes significantly uh, with the angle. Um, so there seems to be some form of interplay, but is there a way to say sort of definitively that the interaction effects are strongest and simply dies very quickly as you go away from the magic angle? So in the calculations we do with, you know, like uh, pristine, uh, the pristine problem, right? Uh, we see a strong magic angle, uh, a strong angle dependence. You go away from the magic angle, we get significant dispersion. A lot of this correlated insulator physics goes away. Uh, whether superconductivity goes away or not is less clear because we don't directly access that. It's not that easy to access. Um, but I think that in the real material, there's a lot of other uh, variables at play. Uh, so people are discovering these variables one by one, how far away the HPN, thickness of the HPN, for example, how the preparation method, twist angle disorder, uh, it's complicated. But um, if you had, like in our calculations, there's definitely very strong dependence on magic angle. If you didn't know about magic angle, you wouldn't see interesting physics, at least in our calculations. Well, another problem, of course, is the distribution of angles, because it's exactly. very difficult to create it in one angle yeah. anyway, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Question, what is the effect of strain on twisted bilayer graphene? Yeah. Is it kind of understood? I think it's not understood. Um, and even how do you model strain is not very clear. It certainly gives it a bigger bandwidth. So one of the effects, one of the simple effects is 
um, it's going to uh, it's going to be less magic, right? Because it's uh, the, the bandwidth is going to increase, so all the correlation physics will will uh, be less strong. Another thing that happens is you know the Dirac points of graphene are located at certain positions because of rotation symmetry. You have broken rotation symmetry; they move off, um, and uh, that will be sometimes important that they can travel through the Brillouin zone uh, if you have this uh, strain. Uh, so we find some dependence on strain. We don't exactly have to model the strain, but we can break the rotation symmetry. And when you do that again, some of these insulating states go away. Um, so I think it's a combination of figuring out what strain actually does and then putting it into these models. But yeah, that's known to be important. Hi. Uh, uh, so um, maybe you said this about that uh, toric code uh, Hamiltonian, uh, the two different confined and deconfined phases. <coughs> You, you said about this to, uh, topological entanglement entropy being different in the right. state. But is it that uh, the, in, uh, the, the overall uh, ground state is uh, less entangled? Uh, in yeah, it's not. No. Uh, it's just log two. <laughs> uh, an, I mean. so, uh, so they are both highly entangled states. Yeah, or different. if you would like, you can say they're both not very entangled states because the way the entanglement uh, grows, it's simply with the perimeter of the cut. So it's just like the boundary spins are talking across the boundary. That's the only, and it's not like the entanglement propagates deep into the bulk uh, of the state. Um, so for example, if I had a Fermi liquid, very simple gapless phase, uh, then you would have uh, the perimeter times the log of the perimeter, L log L, much bigger entanglement, with somehow not such an interesting state. Uh, so it's, it's not simply the amount of entanglement entropy. Um, you really have to figure, there's something non-local about this constant. That's the thing that's why you can't change it by making some local changes uh, on the boundary. Yeah, that's right. It's the constraint, really. You have these big loops, you have a soup of loops, and they're constrained. So my question is that uh, in case of magic angle by like magic angle twisted graphene, what happens to the edge state? Just like in the single layer graphene for a particular edge state, for a particular edge structure, there is a edge state. What happens in the case of this twisted, twisted by layer graphene? That's a good question. Um, I think it really depends on what, um, uh, what the edge looks like. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, uh, so, so some of the band structures that we have, you, I mean, right now they, they kind of look like graphene if you're at neutrality, they have mm. these dark points. Um, so then you might expect very similar kind of edge states. Okay. But uh, can you actually get that kind of edge? Not very clear to me because they're at an angle with respect to each other. Okay. And my second question is related to the even denominator fractional quantum Hall state. Uh -huh. So mostly till now the most steady system is the 5 by 2 even denominator state, but even in the graphene there are the just like 3 by 2 are the even other uh, even denominator states. So what is the difference from that 3 by 2 and 5 by 2? Uh, well, uh, I think they are believed to be the same. I mean, there are two options. There's this uh, Fafian and there's something called the anti fafian is very mm -hmm. closely related. Okay. Um, and depending on which particular state you have, people have proposed one or the other as the ground state. Uh, they may appear at different fractions, but if you look at the Landau level content, it's mm. usually clear that it's the same as the five halves. Uh, like in bilayer graphene, you have some mixing into the mm. first Landau level, so the second Landau level. So you can, ultimately, it's the same kind of physics as five halves. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, um... So regarding the superconducting phases in this twisted bilayer stuff, is there any experimental progress on figuring out the pairing symmetry or any theoretical thing? And... Theoretical, there are lots. OK. <laughs> but no experimental? Uh... No, no definitive experimental. Mm. Yeah, right. But people have made progress in trying to understand when the superconductor appears relative to the correlated insulators. So initially, it was thought very closely tied. There's a correlated insulator, and then there are domes next to it. But now people have found samples where superconductor, but the, that particular correlated insulator is missing, uh, or they're all weakened. Um, 
So I think we're getting a better picture of um, you know, the interplay between superconductivity and the strong correlation physics. Superconductivity seems more robust. It's actually more widespread. In one of your last slides, you said that uh, the boundary of a, the, the Dirac fermion at the boundary of a topological insulator is the same as the particle hole Fafian. Um, one is a very strongly correlated state, the other is a non-interacting or free fermion-like state. Yeah. In what sense are they the same? So if you were to, if I had to answer in one word, they are the same anomalies. So there's something weird about having a single Dirac cone. We know that, right? In two-dimensional band structure, time reversal, you won't get a single Dirac cone. You have to get the surface of a three-dimensional topological insulator. So it has something, something weird about it. That's called the anomaly. The fact that it's a boundary, it can only be realized as a boundary of a three-dimensional phase. But this uh, particle hole Fafian with you know, particle hole, you know, some symmetries, time reversal or something, um, has the same anomaly. So, um, you know, they are, they are weird, they're both weird, but they're weird in the same way. <laughs> right. uh, or if you like, you can add interactions, a single drag cone, and you can eventually convert it into this particle hole symmetric Fafian so that it doesn't break any symmetry. You expect them to be related, uh, but, you know, not to some other state. 